Hello, my name is Ryan Kingsbury, co-founder at Blue Cubed. In this talk, I will discuss optical communications and some of the key engineering trades that face implementation of cross-link systems on small satellites such as CubeSats. I'll also describe some of the work that Blue Cubed is doing in this area. Blue Cubed was formed in 2018 with the focus of developing low swap, cost-effective, and mass-produced RF and optical comm solutions. We have an X-band transmitter product that will be flying later this year, and we are qualifying an optical crosslink terminal for a future mission. Our core technology is a self-alignment scheme that makes the optical crosslink terminal much easier to manufacture. So why crosslinks? Crosslinks are in the headlines a lot these days because of their use in mega constellations like Starlink and Kuiper. These crosslinks are used to reduce dependence on ground infrastructure and to improve the overall connectivity of the network. There are, of course, many other applications for crosslinks. Science applications that have distributed apertures or swarm concepts of operation use crosslinks. And in the defense sector, there's a lot of uh, existing programs to use crosslinks, such as SDA's proliferated LEO vision, as well as the DARPA Blackjack program. The reason why people are using optical and not RF is because radio systems can't really hit very high data rates due to the antenna size restrictions and the limited spectrum that's available for crosslink use. Laser communications is fundamentally a pointing problem. The beam widths, which are what produce the great benefits of the system, are extremely narrow and therefore need to be pointed very precisely. A beam width of 10 microradians is not uncommon. And to put this in perspective, if you were to shine a 10 microradian beam from Boston to Seattle, it would only be about 40 meters across when it reached the other end of the link. Lasercom systems are built from a few key components. First of all, you need a power efficient light source, such as a laser. You need a low noise and high bandwidth detector for receiving the signal. And you also need an acquisition or tracking sensor of some kind to help with pointing alignment. Lastly are the free space optics themselves. These are the telescope, the steering assemblies, and so forth. Some common design trades that come up in designing a laser comm system include the wavelength, which determines component availability and performance. You have the size of the aperture and the configurations that they're installed in. And you also have the platform vibration or jitter as it's known as, uh, which can play a serious role in how you design the satellite as a whole. Before I talk more about crosslinks, I'd like to just compare and contrast downlinks, which have been widely publicized in the CubeSat literature, and crosslinks. So downlinks are typically asymmetric systems. Most, most systems include a fast downlink and a slow or perhaps no uplink at all. Uh, these are somewhat easy in the sense that on the ground side of the link, you can put a very large telescope. You're not really up against any power constraints. And the path lengths themselves tend to be quite a bit shorter. You, of course, have to deal with the atmosphere, which causes scintillation and fading, as well as clouds, which can just cause outright outages at your ground station. Some systems also use an uplink beacon to help with pointing, and this can have safety and licensing uh, requirements. Crosslinks, by comparison, are symmetric. Most assume that they are full duplex in nature, so both directions operate at the same time, and that they operate at equal data rates. One thing that's easier about crosslinks is you don't have to deal with the atmosphere or clouds, but there are other issues which are much harder. For example, the path lengths of these systems can be 4,000 kilometers uh, for a LEO use case. The aperture sizes are limited because both ends are in space. You're up against the satellite's own power constraints. You have to very carefully align both the transmit and receive signals. And there's also an issue of handedness where you want any satellite to be able to talk to any other satellite. In general, crosslinks are the more challenging problem, but you can take a crosslink terminal in some cases and use it for downlink purposes. As I mentioned earlier, wavelength is one of the key system trades in designing an optical comm system. There are largely two different paths one can take. The first is to use 1550 nanometers. This is in the infrared, and it's where fiber telecom operates. There are a huge number of components that have been developed for this industry, and use of them is very enticing. There are fiber amplifiers, which are optical devices, 
and th those can operate uh, at pretty much unlimited bandwidth. There's also detectors, including preamplified detectors available for these wavelengths. Uh, and then tracking, you can use either quad cells or shortwave IR cameras. 1550 systems are very attractive when you need to achieve extremely high data rates. Modern fiber telecom equipment can do 100, 200, or even 400 gigabits per second on a single wavelength. This is great for systems like Starlink or Kuiper. An alternative to 1550 is to operate in the visible between 450 and 800 nanometers. This is where silicon devices work. Uh, and some of these that are very advantageous for LaserCom would include directly modulated laser diodes, which can achieve a much higher power efficiency than fiber amplifiers. You have detectors, which tend to be less noisy. And you can also use just plain old camera sensors to do your acquisition and tracking. In other words, 1550 is a great choice if you're trying to go extremely fast, but is perhaps not the power efficient choice for a CubeSat platform. Designing an aperture system for a, a LaserCom terminal is another important design trade space. The aperture has two functions. It needs to get photons from free space into the comms detector, and it also needs to take photons from the transmit source, a laser, and put them into free space. The gain and directivity of an aperture is a function of its diameter and the wavelength that you're operating at. And to give an example for folks that are familiar with uh, RF antenna gains, an 850 nanometer wavelength system operating through an 11 millimeter aperture has a gain of about 92 dBi. Note that you can't really increase the aperture size without limit. Uh, mass in particular is a strong penalty. It, it scales with roughly the cube of the aperture diameter. And in general, space optics are a hard problem. So you want to have diffraction limited performance, but you need to worry about things like thermal defocus, launch loading, and radiation darkening. In terms of how you configure the aperture or apertures, there are two different approaches that are common. One is dual aperture optics. So this is where you have a separate transmit and receive aperture. It has the advantage that you've got really good isolation between the two paths, but you have to make sure they're aligned really well. There's also the mass inefficiency of having a second aperture. Alternatively, you can use a single aperture system. You do need some combining optics that give you good isolation between transmit and receive but this makes it easier to maintain the overall alignment of the system and is of course more mass efficient. At Blue Cube, we're a firm believer in single aperture systems. Pointing is of course the fundamental problem of LaserCom. Usually pointing in a LaserCom terminal is achieved with a multi-stage approach. There's a coarse steering assembly, which allows the system to point roughly in the right direction of the other, uh, other satellite. In the case of a CubeSat, this is commonly done with body pointing, but gimbals and beam directors are also a possibility. Then you need a fine steering mechanism. This is what gets you down to that sub beam width pointing accuracy, and it's commonly needed to compensate for platform vibrations that arise from things like reaction wheels and other mechanisms. Ideally, you could address these at the source, but the fact is most people design satellites and they don't have optical comm in mind from the beginning. Both of these coarse and fine steering control loops require knowledge of the pointing error. You need to have some way of measuring how you're misaligned. And for crosslinks in particular, what matters is the relative error between the transmit and the receive signals. That is the key piece of information you need to steer the system appropriately. Now I'd like to shift gears and talk about Blue Cube's development of Cobalt, its optical transceiver product. This is a full duplex optical transceiver that is roughly a half U in size and can operate it up to three gigabits per second. It has a common 11 millimeter aperture and we believe it is an industry leading solution in terms of its size, weight, and power per megabit per second delivered. Cobalt is part of a larger product offering though, which includes things like the fast steering mirror, and the free space optics, beam expanders and beam directors. Blue Cube just decided to take this approach because each mission has its own unique requirements. 
And it's very hard to justify custom designs for each customer that we engage with. Therefore, we've designed a portfolio of products that are interchangeable so that you can mix and match the pieces that you need for your particular application. So in the simplest case of a body-pointed CubeSat that has a relatively short link range for a crosslink, you might be able to just use the Cobalt unit by itself. Similarly, a system that requires multiple crosslinks on a noisy bus that has a lot of vibration may require the full suite. The modular approach is really all about flexibility. Circling back to Cobalt itself, I want to highlight some of the key features of, of its design. So first of all, it has a patented self-alignment approach. This allows us to relax the manufacturing tolerances and it makes the system much more robust to loading of things like thermal loading, launch loads, etc. In fact, although this one here is aluminum, our initial prototypes were printed on a hobby class 3D printer and were able to achieve sub microradian pointing. It, Cobalt also features a wide field of view sensor that's used for acquisition and link setup. And this same sensor is able to deliver kilohertz bandwidth updates on pointing knowledge. This is the key piece of information that you need to close those pointing control loops that I mentioned earlier. Cobalt uses a directly modulated laser diode, which gives it a huge power efficiency advantage over a fiber amplifier system. And lastly is the common transmit and receive aperture. This simplifies alignment and reduces overall mass of the system. And it can't be understated how important this is for a mass production context. So in closing, I'd just like to say that optical crosslinks are certainly feasible on swap-constrained CubeSats today. Visible and near-IR wavelengths, in particular, are very enticing for CubeSats because you can leverage high-efficiency laser diodes and silicon detectors, which are low-cost, power-efficient, and very low noise. BlueCube is developing LaserCom products that are specifically tailored for these swap-constrained applications. We've confirmed our differential tracking approach in thermal testing, and we're currently in the process of a full environmental qual on the, on the Cobalt unit. If you have any questions, I would encourage you to contact us. Thank you for your time and attention.